they be of God. John? Yes, John 4, 1 John 4, verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So this means most people that profess to be preachers are false prophets. That's what it means. And the scripture says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Right? So if there's, if there's a straight gate and a narrow way and few find it, this is the gate kept by the true prophets. Now there's also a broad way, a, a wide gate and a broad way that leadeth unto destruction. And it says many there be which go thereat. And so this is, this is just what is, this is just what is, is prophesied in the scriptures of the outcome of, of man standing before God. So most men are going to go through a wide gate and they're going to walk, they're going to walk a broad way onto destruction. And it's the false prophets that keep those gates. Now, if this is the case, if your eternal soul is on the line and the scripture says, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is a cause of grave concern. This is a cause where you can't just hear every man and what every man has to say. Jesus said that if the blind lead the blind, they'll all fall into the ditch, right? So, you know, the scripture says the ear trieth words like the tongue tasteth meat. And a wise man will not hearken to every voice. You know, a fool is known in multitude of words. And how are you all going to be preserved if you don't study the scriptures? If you don't seek to know what God says in his word? just go and hear this preacher and hear that preacher now, just being blown about God, just, just like what it says truth. in Ephesians chapter I mean, 4 verse 14. What I mean to ask you is when you are referring to this you, you are talking against the preacher who was here or against one of them? I see what's what? happening in this entire park it's disturbing. I see women preachers over here preaching against the scriptures yeah. because the scripture says that, she saw, that God suffers not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over a man. Yeah. I hear Seventh Day Adventists over here preaching their heresies. There's you know, Sabbatarians that are walking around trying to get men to keep the, keep the, the law, you yeah, know, yeah, that no, the Apostle Paul said. No, um, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to contend for the very things that the Apostle Paul was contending against. You know, like there's all manner of just unclean beasts, unclean words that are being preached here. And where is the prudent man? Go away. You are on your David. Go. I'm just concerned. I mean, this man here, I didn't get to hear much of what he was saying. I heard him from over there and I was disturbed and I came to listen. And I heard, I heard one heresy. He's preaching against the Trinity. The scripture speaks very clearly about the Trinity, that God is one. He's unified with himself. And at the baptism of Christ, we see the three persons of the Trinity there on the scene in one location. We see the Son baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Ghost coming down from heaven, lighting upon him like a dove, and the voice of the Father coming from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus said, Jesus said this, you know, to teach all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, because God is one. That means he's unified with himself. God said, let us make man in our image. What did he mean when he said that? He was communing with a council among the Trinity. This is not, this is not a mystery. It's, it's plainly written. You can read it in Isaiah 6. When God spoke to Isaiah, he said, who will go for us? He didn't say, who will go for me? He said, who will go for us? Who's he talking about? Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There are three that bear record in the earth and three that bear record in heaven. Thank you. When the Bible was so baptized, this is very concerning. When the Bible was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Son. That's what Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to baptize those that would believe on him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. But when the Bible was baptized, when the Bible was baptized. Peter, Peter baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, this is just what Christ said. Doesn't that sound like a doubtful disputation? If that's what Christ said, why do we need to make it make an issue of it? The Lord said it. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because there are three persons in the Trinity. The reason Jesus wouldn't be saying this if there weren't three separate persons that are deity, that are to be worshipped as God. 
Here it is. It's very, very plainly written. You, now, why do violence against the doctrine of the Trinity it? when it's very clear that Christ spoke of it? Christ commanded that men should be baptized in the name of all three persons of the Godhead. When all three persons of the Godhead are present at Christ's baptism, and all throughout the scriptures it speaks of the plural when God is communing with himself. Why should we, de why should we debate this matter? We're not debating, I'm just asking a question. Right, well, it's a very serious thing that a man would deny the Trinity, would deny the Father. The scripture says that Jesus Christ, when all things are subdued under his feet, he will deliver the kingdom to the Father. Right? Isn't that what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? That, that Adam and Eve rebelled by the counsel of the devil and, and took God's creation and led it astray because man was given the, um, the command over the garden that he should care for it and till it and, uh, and keep it rather. And then he went astray. And then Christ... The, the Son of God came and redeemed and destroyed the works of the devil. And, deli and his, his intention is to deliver the kingdom back to his Father again at the end. When all, when all dominion and all principalities are subdued under his feet, he's going to deliver the kingdom back to his Father. The scripture says that they should worship the Son even as they worship the Father. There are certainly three persons in the Godhead. So if a man is denying that, he's denying the scriptures. That's concerning. That's concerning. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever met a oneness Pentecostal who's not demon-possessed. Does that trouble you? Does that trouble you that a man is denying the doctrine of the scriptures? Ah. But he's not there. He's confirming he's, he's one. How is he denying? Well, I'm, I'm assuming he's a oneness. Like it's a doctrine. It's a, it's a heresy. Oneness. They believe God is numerically one. When the scripture says God is one, what it means is that he is unified with himself, right? Like to be at one with somebody, to, it means to be uh, unified with them, to be at one. The, uh, the at one -ment, atonement, you've heard the word atonement, the blood of Christ being shed, and that is our propitiation, which can make a man at one with God, at peace, to have uh, an agreement with God. And William Tyndale coined the word because there was no English word. He called it at one meant the state of being at one with God, right? So this word is used to signify unity, unity. So the Godhead, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, one God. And so what that means is that the Godhead is unified with itself. But all throughout the scriptures, it speaks in the plural. So there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And y'all should believe that because the scriptures teach it very plainly. Right? Let God be true and every man alive. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they should believe the glorious gospel and be converted. That's what it says in Isaiah 6. The same thing. Go and preach, you know, until the, the cities be utterly wasted and destroyed. Isaiah said, How long? Because the people have ears and hear not. They have eyes and they see not. As people, it's like, and, and, and the book of Ezekiel says, this people cometh to thee as those that come to hear a lovely song, right? They like to hear the beautiful sound. They like to hear the, the debate and the, and the excitement of what's being preached. And then they go their way and they do not. They do not the things that God is convicting them about. You know what you're asking for? You're asking for the judgment of God. If you hear something that's pricking your heart and you know you've sinned against the Lord and you don't go humble yourself before God, you're asking for a delusion. Because they receive not the love of the truth, therefore God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is serious matter. This is not some laughing, joking matter. You all need to repent of your sins. And not just stand around and have some laughable debate about doctrinal minors. Right? Didn't Jesus himself say that there are weightier matters of the law? He said, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. And you give all manner of tithe, of mint, anise, and cumin. He said, these things ought you to have done, but not to leave the other undone. This is far greater. This is of greater importance. That's what Christ is saying. Sorry about that. That's what Christ said. This is of greater importance. Mercy, judgment, and faith. Judgment upon yourself. And a seeking of mercy. 
and a, and a true faith in God that saves a man from sin. These are the weightier matters of the law. Let's not even go anywhere else. How, how many of you just overpassed your sins and just behaved yourself as though God isn't going to judge you? Do you know what happens? When you're convicted of sin and you, don't, and you don't humble yourself before God, your heart is hardened. That's what happens. And then you end up standing in some circus of men, giggling and laughing at some demonstration of flesh. It's a judgment of God. False prophets are sent as a judgment of God. You need to fear the Lord. Turn from evil. Turn from your sins. How many of you even believe it's, it's possible that Jesus Christ can save you from your sins? I'm talking about the sins of the heart. I'm not just talking about the outward sins. Did you know Jesus Christ can make you free? He can set you free. I was, I was a lost sinner too. Until I was 23 years old, I was addicted to marijuana. I was a drunk. I was a fornicator. I was covetous. Truly, name them all. I was a sinner. And God began to judge my life and he made me sober. He made me consider the brevity of life and how I'm going to stand before the fearful God of heaven and earth. And as I began to consider these things more and more, and when, when I read Revelation chapter 6 about how the mighty men of the earth and the great men and the noble men and the chief captains and every bondman and every poor man and every free man hid themselves in the caves and they cried unto the rocks and said, Fall on us and hide us for the face of the Lamb, for the day of His wrath has come, and who can stand? I saw that. I saw that was me. I saw that the wrath of God was pursuing me. And I couldn't just giggle and laugh about these things. I was troubled. I was troubled. And when I called upon the Lord, He heard my cry because I was poor in spirit. Let us not omit these weightier matters. Where is the, poor, where is the poverty of spirit? When I was poor in spirit, I called upon the Lord. Hear me now. Hear me now. When I was poor in spirit, and I called upon the Lord, He heard my cry, and He delivered me. And I saw the glory of God, and all my sins were washed away. He dealt with my sins. He washed them away, white as snow. Truly, all the sins that I loved and could not repent of, I could not forsake them because I loved them so much, because I had a heart issue. I could have just put it away practically. I could. I could put it away practically. But I saw how my heart still longed for those sins. And God needed to change my heart. He needed to make me a new creature. Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so when I saw the glory of Jesus Christ, His majesty, his, the fearful dread of the Lord Jesus Christ, I was made a new creature. And all my old sins passed away. And it was replaced with a, with a love for God's word. I wanted to read his, his Bible. I wanted to pray. I wanted to know other true Christians. You know? Y'all need to be saved. What are you talking about? Just bringing up matters of, of little importance when y'all are going to hell. You can ask your question. Hello, question. Just us. I've been in jail, in a prison, like for two years. In prison, you just pray. You surrender your life to Jesus. I've been committed. So, after all, I joined Muslim, I joined SD. I just see how they pray, how they worship. Then I was in the stable of SBL. I give my life to Jesus. Then I surrender my life to Jesus when I'm in jail. But after getting outside the jail, I just go back to the sin that I was doing. What's the difference? That's you not that's not regeneration. Jesus. That's not born again. You're not born again. Huh? That's not a born yeah, again you experience. Surrender to Jesus. Because there's one. I've seen all of my friends that we were there. We are born again. We are worshiping. Yeah, indeed. Every time when you want to see the sun, you have to worship. When you want to sit on the chair, you have to be worshiping. So all the time you're worshiping. But after all, when I come out, I just come to the same same place where I was. But I keep Lord my I keep surrender to Jesus. You didn't truly surrender to Jesus. You don't know who Jesus is. How shall they preach? No, no. Listen. That's what I'm saying. Listen to what it says in Romans 10. I'll answer your question with Romans 10. Look what it says. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is verse 13. So, it's that simple. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So, is it just calling on the five letters of a man's name? Just Jesus? I heard Jesus can save me, so I'll just call out his name to the heavens and I'll be saved? No, that's not what it teaches. There's a whole... There's a whole the, Paul says that I am free from the blood of all men because I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. There's a whole book of counsel that needs to be understood. It says, it says, 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And it says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring the glad tidings of good things. Now you see, the, the preaching of the gospel isn't in word only, but it's in the demonstration of the spirit and in power. That's what the Bible says. That's what the apostle Paul said. And our preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and in power. So what does that mean? It means that the Apostle Paul demonstrated the life of Christ. He wasn't just speaking words. He wasn't just crafting and knitting together cunningly devised scriptures to try to make some legal case that he did not experience himself. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was a preacher of righteousness sent by God. But Paul and... and uh, in Acts chapter 9 was going to Damascus Jesus Christ himself re revealed himself to him and commissioned him and sanctified him and sent him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light from the power of the devil to the power of God from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son so Paul was sent and so because he saw the glory of God he was changed in the very same image that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 we behold Christ as in a glass darkly and by beholding him, we are transformed in the very same image from glory to glory. That's what, that's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. So, a man can preach all kinds of words. He can, he can put together cunningly crafted, devised, you know, arguments from the scriptures even. And be completely misled and not be demonstrating Christ at all. How shall they preach except they be sent? And so this is the question, like Elijah. Remember Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and he challenged the prophets of Baal and the people were all confused. This is a lot like this crowd, right? There's a whole nation of Israel and they don't know who the Lord is. And they're just going to listen to this prophet of Baal and then they're going to go listen to this prophet of Molech. And then they'll, oh, there's a prophet of the Lord, so-called. And we'll go listen to him. And Elijah alone was a prophet of the Lord, the scripture says. And he called all the false prophets of Baal and they offered their sacrifice and he mocked their sacrifice and then he showed by fire coming down from heaven that God accepted his sacrifice and all the people knew at that point, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Because fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. And the Apostle Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, if I yet preach circumcision, the offense of the cross would cease. That's what he said. All he had to do was compromise in this one little way. And I've heard people out here preaching circumcision, literally, that you must be circumcised to be saved. And in Paul's day, this was a compromise of the gospel. And if he preached circumcision, if there was one way they could be justified apart from the free gift of God and Jesus Christ all consuming them and living in them. The Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So he was filled with the Spirit. The life that he was living was not even his own. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. That's what Paul said. So it was Jesus Christ living his life again through Paul. Okay? So the Apostle Paul said, If I yet preach circumcision, the offense of the cross has ceased. But what did Paul's life look like? What did Paul's life look like? Are you listening? What did Paul's life look like? Stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, perils, nakedness, famine, sword. Truly, just hunted, troubled, fleeing from the Jews on every hand. Because he was, a, he was a crucified man. Because he preached something that the flesh cannot tolerate. And if this man was preaching something flesh cannot tolerate, then all these fleshly men standing by wouldn't be laughing and joking. They'd be either offended or they'd be convicted. And then some people would be getting right with God. And then maybe some would be conspiring to kill the man. That's what happened with the Apostle Paul. And so this was the demonstration of the gospel. Paul was sent. And that means that Paul was persecuted. Jesus said, blessed are you when men shall persecute you, cast out your name for, as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He said, rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. For so did they to the true prophets. The true prophets. Right? The false prophets turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Just a laughing, joking matter. That's what lasciviousness is. It's lightness, carelessness, right? Looseness. Just kind of walking around, being a circus act. Just making a show making everybody laugh. That's what was happening here. The unity of believers, because many preachers have many, they preach differently. There is one who will tell you that you are not supposed to give time, 
type master of the Old Testament people. Now we live in the New Testament. There are many preachers. Yes, I that's a good question. That's yeah. a good question. Uh, the the only other time, I mean, there, there there could have been other times, but the most clear, crystal clear picture of what we're experiencing now in these days would have been the first century when Christ came. There was many sects of the Jews. There was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Herodians. Um, the, uh, there was another sect, and there was probably others. And there was other. And the Scripture says there were, there was false messiahs le leading men out into the wilderness. And, other false men leading men here and there's all kinds of like false messiahs rising up so there's all kinds of sects many denominations but when christ came they were all wrong weren't they even the most even the most upright among them which was the pharisees you know that's why paul boasted that he was a pharisee in philippians chapter 3 only to cast it down and say it was dumb because to be a pharisee was to be of the strictest sect of the jewish religion and christ found them to be wrong because fundamentally they were not converted and they hated the christ that came to them if Christ would have come and he would have yielded to their sins, if he would have just suffered them the way they were and flattered them like all men flatter other men, then they would have made him the king. They would have made him the king, but Christ would have sacrificed his communion with the Father, but he was not willing to do that. So he was a light. The scripture says, light doth make manifest. It says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. So Jesus Christ made no peace with flesh. And that's why he was hung on a tree and crucified. Because he reproved the unfruitful works of darkness. He said, the world hates me because I testify that the works thereof are evil. Now these are all scriptures. I'm just quoting scriptures. I've hardly said anything of my own words. Maybe just a few linking words just to connect the scriptures together. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So Jesus Christ was a man who had no peace with flesh because he was fully of the spirit. God giveth not the spirit by measure unto the son of God. Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, that being the case, no flesh had peace in his presence. And so it would be to any spirit-filled man on this earth. They would walk in the same steps. The Bible says, if any man say, he abide in Christ, he also ought to walk even as he walked. This is just the natural overflow of a man full of the spirit. He's going to be, he's going to be a reproach to all flesh. He's going to be a sword and a division and, a, and, a, and an instrument of slaying all flesh because that's the hope of the gospel. Not, hey, raise your hand. Do you believe what I'm saying? Oh, okay, let's go get baptized. No, no, your flesh needs to be slain. You need to be so convicted of your sins that you're willing to lose your life. There's terms to the gospel. The gospel isn't just some raise your hand and repeat after me matter. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. You know what that means? You have to give your life to him. Full surrender, full surrender. He doesn't want you to just like be some partner with him in the work of the kingdom of God. You cannot glorify God. The flesh cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God, the scripture says. You must be crucified. That's why Jesus said, if any man will be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Because you're going to a hill to die. And when your, when your will is crucified, the spirit of God will overshadow you and you'll be led by the spirit of God and you will live the life of Christ in the earth. Christ will be with you and in you and and it, it won't look anything like what we see today. How many people profess to be Christ? Jesus said this. He said, the works that I do, ye shall do greater. Isn't that a reproach to what, what is called Christianity today? That's what happened with John and Peter and James. They were going about doing miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead. Just turning the world upside down. The whole world was upside down because of the 12 apostles and those that were, that were with them and the other apostles as well.